there are two major camps regarding consciousness. There are the people that say consciousness is either something you have or something you don't have. Um, to these people, there is no way a machine can ever be conscious. They will say that a machine can pretend to be conscious. You can say, if question equals are you conscious, response equals yes, I certainly am. But no matter what the machine ever does, it will always forever be faking it because machines don't have the special secret sauce that is consciousness. Um, however, if we build machines, we can make them with varying levels of complexity. For example, I happen to have a certain vacuum, which is definitely not conscious, but this vacuum exhibits a property which is an important part of consciousness called awareness. Now, the reason I know my vacuum has awareness is it has sensors and it doesn't bump into my piano. That's what awareness is. Awareness is when you can operate with an understanding of the environment around you. Well, my vacuum's a little bit more sophisticated than just responding directly to its sensors. See, it actually builds an internal map of its environment. I know this because it follows a path that goes back and forth and back and forth until my whole room is vacuumed and that path navigates around the piano. So apparently it has built a plan and follows the plan and the plan utilizes understanding of its environment. Now, I would be very readily to, ex I would very, be very ready to accept if someone said that that's not real consciousness. But I have a hard time saying it's not real awareness because that's kind of what awareness is, right? Well, as a human, we don't actually experience the real world and we can actually prove this. Physicists will tell us that light can come in any wavelength. What's so special about light that's 700 nanometers in size? Well, it's red. We as humans see the color red and it stimulates the, re the red cones on the back of our eye. And we experience this as a very meaningful color, very distinct from green or blue or any other color of light. And yet, what really is different about, different about light in the physical world? Nothing. It's just light with a different wavelength. We don't actually experience the physical world. What we experience is our understanding of the world. So in that sense, we're not all that different from the vacuum. Well, the other camp, instead of saying consciousness is something you have or something you don't have, we'll say consciousness is something you, that emerges from what we do. This is the camp I belong in. It says that consciousness actually does something. It's useful and it has a purpose. Now, a reasonable question to ask if consciousness actually does something, if it does have a purpose, what is it? Why do we have consciousness? More specifically, why did evolution select for consciousness? Why did it give us this thing that's so critical, that's such an important part of our identities and who we are and that our entire consciousness revolves around? Um, well, let's do a quick little walkthrough of the evolution of ideas. Now, I want to emphasize that I'm not walking through the evolution of biology. They're actually quite different stories, although they begin in a similar place. So, the very first ideas that existed on this planet, as far as we know, were about four billion years ago and were encoded in biomolecules. This is either DNA or RNA. Now, Richard Dawkins referred to these as memes. In a sense, memes were the first living things, the first things that wanted to reproduce, but, but they, they weren't actually the physical body of the creature. You think, if you think about it, we as humans live in houses, why? Because they're comfortable, right? It's a lot easier to live. You wouldn't want to reproduce out in a park, but in a house, it's a nice, more comfortable place to do that. Similarly, the body of the cell is not really the living thing. It's the meme encoded in the DNA that really wants to reproduce. The cell is an environment that it created for itself. It's like a house. It's a place where it's more comfortable living and doing what it does. Approximately two billion years ago, something really profound happened. The memes improved their environments. They made them much more, much more amenable for their own reproduction by a little something called sex. Now, prior to sex, uh, evolution progressed very, very slowly. Every time a meme copied itself, it could only do so by asexual reproduction. And this was a very awkward thing for ideas because imagine a think tank and everyone in the room keeps coming up with exactly the same idea. How useful is this think tank? You just have one idea, right? With modulo, however many mutations occur. Well, when sex came along, all of a sudden, we were taking these genes and shuffling them together like a deck of cards, 
every single new generation was exploring a completely new idea, one that had never been considered before. This diversity was a humongous boon for the evolution of ideas, and suddenly they were evolving at an unprecedented rate. In the last two billion years, which is less than half of the history of this Earth, we've gone from single-celled organisms to apes sitting at co-founder carrying cell phones and attending tech talks. Everything that we have accomplished from single-celled organisms on has happened because the environment has become more amenable for evolution. But sex wasn't the last time that the memes improved their environments. There's another one that was really profound. It's not as clear when this happened, but it was less than a billion years ago when centralized nervous systems started to emerge. Now, if you think about it, this is approximately when the evolution of ideas diverged from the evolution of biology. Because inside of brains, memes can reproduce without physical bodies. Imagine the advantage of shedding your physical body. In my, without, just this morning, I had probably a few hundred ideas, and I don't even have any new children. <laughs> now, a person that has his eye focused on biological evolution will probably say that the brain is the pinnacle, the highest achievement of evolution. And in a sense it is, but if we're looking at the evolution of ideas, they have actually gone much, much farther than human brains even. You see, once a bunch of brains started realizing they could produce ideas, they discovered they could do it more effectively when they got together in groups. This is not that dissimilar from single-celled organisms realizing that if they clump together and form multicellular organisms, they can live and thrive more effectively. Similarly, a whole bunch of brains can come up with ideas, but when they work together to divide up the space, to uh, organize and to share papers with each other, they can produce ideas even more effectively than before. So science, I claim, is yet another evolutionary improvement to the environment that allowed the memes to spread and grow. These ideas are desperate to reproduce, desperate to grow. They'll do anything to improve the environment so that they can continue reproducing and generating diversity and evolving. And even science, I claim, is not the pinnacle development of the evolution of ideas because science came along and did what? It built the internet. Suddenly, the entire Earth has a centralized nervous system. And even the, Earth, even the internet wasn't the optimal environment for the evolution of memes, so we built social media on top of the internet. And now all kinds of memes are evolving in social me inside social media. And interestingly, they're the great, 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 great descendants of the original memes that were encoded in biomolecules. There's, there's so much I could say about the evolution of ideas today, but I want to focus on one very particular aspect of it because this is the aspect where consciousness evolved. So let's talk about how brains are divided up. You were probably taught at some point that you have two hemispheres in your brain. You have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere, and the left hemisphere is responsible for analytical thought, and the right hemisphere is responsible for creative thought. Unfortunately, if you talk to a neuroscientist, they will tell you that this theory is wrong. It's now been debunked, and we no longer teach it anymore. Although I do have to put a little asterisk by that because it's not completely wrong, it's only mostly wrong. It turns out that we actually do have a left and a right hemisphere. There is modularization going on within the brain, and they do different things. It's just that the, the differentiation is not analytic and creative thought. What it actually seems to be more of is observation. That is, the left, the left hemisphere of your brain takes care of things that you can directly see and think about consciously, and the right hemisphere of the brain seems to process intuitive thought a little bit more. Um, there's a lot of evidence behind this, and I don't have time to talk about it, so I'm going to simply refer you to a zippy little video by CGP Gray. It's titled UR2. If you haven't seen it, I recommend this video. It's lots of fun. Uh, if you talk to neuroscientists, though, the left and right hemisphere is not the only division in the brain they'll point at. There's one they're trying to emphasize more recently, which is the upper and the inner brain. When I say upper brain, I'm talking about this uh, gray layer of neurons on the surface of this wrinkly layer we call your cerebrum. That's on the top. And when I say inner brain, I'm talking about this cluster of lobes at the top of your spinal cord. This is the inner brain. Now, the upper brain seems to be responsible for your knowledge, your beliefs, your understanding, your awareness, everything that you know and understand about the world. You use your upper brain to predict the consequences of things and how physics happens and what's going on in the world. Your inner brain seems to be responsible for your choices, your values, your actions, the things that are important to you, the things that you think about and care about and are passionate about. One of the ways we know this is if we study creatures, we can find 
interesting patterns. If we look at reptiles, such as a crocodile, for example, they have all the lobes of the inner brain, but their upper brain is not very well developed. It's very small and not very prominent in the way they think. By contrast, say a chimpanzee also has all the lobes of an inner brain, but it has a very large, very prominent upper brain, and the chimpanzee is much more able to anticipate the consequences of its actions and to do things that are complex and that lead to more sophisticated outcomes. If we take this uh, example and apply it to humans, imagine a scenario where a boy meets girl, and this boy has two choices before him. He can either give the girl flowers, or he can spray her with a hose. All very good options. But as he uses his upper brain to anticipate what the consequences of his choices will likely be, he sees that they don't lead to the same thing. While the hose probably gives him some immediate schadenfreude, giving the girl flowers might be very uncomfortable, but will ultimately lead to some long-term outcome that probably aligns better with his interests. So you can see how he would make this choice. In my opinion, though, this example is even more interesting if we look at it from the perspective of the girl. You see, she's also using her upper brain to try and anticipate the future. And she's also using her inner brain to try and decide what's important and what she values. But the difference is, she has a more difficult situation. She has to predict what a conscious being is going to do, and that's hard. Well, when this boy actually does something, there's going to be a difference between what he does and what she predicted was probably going to happen. And this difference between what she predicted and what really happens is what we call predictive error. The reason predictive error is important is it tells us how we need to modify our upper brains in order to align with the world. The more we engage in this process, predicting and then observing, the more we refine our models until we actually can effectively predict what's happening in the world, and we get pretty good at it. In essence, what I'm suggesting is the brain is a future predicting machine. It enables us to predict the future with some degree of fidelity so that we can make choices that align with our values. Well. Change is unfortunately very painful. So when this girl finds that she needs to modify her brain, when she needs to learn something, she's going to experience some very strong emotions. What are these emotions? Either she's going to be really upset or maybe really happy with this boy, but why do we feel them? Why do they seem so important? Why are they such a, a core part of who we are? And why are they such a central part of the human experience? To answer this question, I'm going to turn, somewhat ironically, to an internet meme. Here we have The Rock. And he's mansplaining about how machines don't have really subjective experiences. They don't feel pain or experience love. Backseat girl says, that's true. At best, a complex machine might think it does. And The Rock says, well, sure, but those are just philosophical zombies, meaning they fake like they're conscious, but they're not really conscious. And the backseat girl says, of course, you realize you are a complex machine that thinks it has subjective experiences. Now, if you think about that for a minute, there is absolutely no scientific test to tell us whether or not we are conscious. So what if you, as a human being, are not really conscious? What if you just think you are? Yes. Well, usually the right response to this is to say, Dr. Gashler, you're being ridiculous. If you think you're conscious, the very act of thinking you're conscious demonstrates consciousness. So if you think you are, then of course you're conscious, right? Well, in essence, that's what it is. When you think you're in pain, you are in pain because that's what pain is. Pain is thinking you're in pain. There's no physical equivalent of that. Pain is the thought that you're in pain. And so that's what a subjective experience is. A lot more to say about how the brain works and how the brain learns, but I'm going to refer you to a book because I just don't have time to talk all about it. Um, <laughs> This is a really accessible book. It's called On Intelligence by Jeff Hawkins. He talks all about the cerebrum, how it learns by predictive error minimization. Fantastic book, and you don't have to have a PhD to read it. There's a sequel to this called A Thousand Brains where he talks even more about it and reveals something that I think is really interesting. He suggests that the cerebrum, that's this upper brain that I was talking about, is actually made up of a whole bunch of tiny portions called cortical columns. And interestingly, these cortical columns have been found to be patterned very similarly to the inner brain. In other words, what seems to have happened is evolution decided instead of just having one brain, let's just make a whole bunch of them. Well, recently I took my family to the symphony at the Walton Arts Center, and we were all sitting there listening to the uh, beautiful music, but I couldn't stop looking at the orchestra and thinking to myself, oh my gosh, it's a model of the brain. You see right here, we have the inner brain. And the inner brain's job is to decide who needs to be playing at any time. He points at the brass section, and the brass section does their little ditty, and then he points at the string section, and they do the same thing. Right here, we have the cortical columns that make up the upper brain. 
each cortical column specializes in a different aspect of your understanding, a different aspect of the things you know. This person here plays the piccolo, this person knows everything you know about European history, this person knows how to use chopsticks, and this other person knows how to throw a baseball. You can imagine everything you know at some point is modeled in one of these different cortical columns. And if you have different brains specializing on different, in different aspects of what you know, you can learn each of those things with much higher fidelity. You're using several of them right now just to parse the words that I'm speaking to you. But it wouldn't work very well since you have a f only one physical body if all of your thousands of brains were all fighting over what you're going to be doing. And so you must have a centralized bottleneck, an inner brain, so to speak, that orchestrates the whole thing. And this is what creates the stream of consciousness. This is why humans are really bad at multitasking. This is why you think about one thing and then your mind wanders to something else. And then as I talk about another subject, your mind wanders over to that. And then I say pink elephants and all of a sudden your pink elephant cortical column woke up. And I can wake up your cortical columns just by throwing out a word, but this is your inner brain deciding which cortical column gets the spotlight, which one's active or which one is pointing the baton to. As we put all these things together, we're starting to realize that if we're going to have a full theory of consciousness, we're going to have to answer a lot of really hard questions. What is awareness? What is self-awareness? Why do we have these subjective experiences? Why do we think in a stream of consciousness? And what is the subconscious mind? Why do thoughts pop into our heads as if they're coming from nowhere? And for every single one of these questions, we're going to have to answer something really tough. Why? Why is it there? Why did we develop it? Why was there evolutionary pressure for these aspects of consciousness to evolve. But if you'll remember, we've kind of talked about why we have awareness. You see, awareness is when you build an internal model of your external environment. Why is there evolutionary pressure for us to develop an internal model of what's around us? Because that's what we experience. A creature that has an internal ac and accurate model of its environment can operate more effectively in that external environment. And self-awareness is when that model becomes sufficiently sophisticated that we actually start to model our own individual selves inside of that model. Now, if you think about it, there was probably even more evolutionary pressure for self-awareness to evolve because you are part of every single experience that you have. So if you're thinking about what's in your best evolutionary interest, if you're trying to take care of yourself, having a very accurate understanding of your own self is of critical importance. Now we might ask, why do we have these subjective experiences? Why does red seem like such a meaningful thing? Or why does pain hurt so darn much? And why does love feel so deep and meaningful? Well, we talked about that too. You see, if you believe you have subjective experiences, that's what a subjective experience is because we experience our own models. We don't experience the physical world. What does it mean to believe you have a subjective experience? It means that this model of self-awareness that you have built over time through predictive error minimization says you do. In other words, if the model inside says you have subjective experiences, well, then you believe you do. And if you believe you do, you're having them. Why do we think in a stream of consciousness? Very simple, because there's a bottleneck. There has to be so that we can orchestrate all of these brains working together. And what is the subconscious mind? Well, although we have a thousand different brains, there can really only be one in charge at any moment, one that the conductor's pointing his baton at, and all of those other cortical columns in your brain are still searching, they're still looking for possible futures that might align with the values that you have. If one of them finds it, what's going to happen? Well, a thought's gonna pop into your mind, and it's gonna seem like it came from nowhere, but really what that is is your mind constantly searching its space, trying to find better and better options for you that will align better with your values, the things that you actually want, that will find a future that you find desirable. As we put all these things together, we find we actually have a complete theory of consciousness. Every once in a while, someone says to me, science has, doesn't know the first thing about what consciousness is. I find that really mind-boggling. We certainly don't know the last thing about what consciousness is, but we absolutely do have a theory of consciousness. We can explain why it's here, and we can explain why every single piece of it had evolutionary pressure to evolve. This is what a theory is, and I think there's a lot of evidence to believe that we're at least partly on the right track towards understanding consciousness. Now, when people start to realize that, the first question they usually want to ask is, okay, great, but if we understand it, then why haven't we built it yet? When are machines going to wake up and be conscious? I'm going to throw this question back at you. When does a boy become a man? You see, 
Biology doesn't draw these thresholds. It's perfectly fine for us to draw an arbitrary threshold and say, well, when the boy has this particular experience or completes this achievement, then he's a man. But nature is still going to continue to treat it as a continuum. And that's the way it is with consciousness, too. It's not a do you have it or do you not have it thing. Machines are already, to some extent, conscious, but not all the way. And so people will usually then ask, OK, great. When are machines going to be more conscious than people? Because that's a pretty important moment, right? Unfortunately, I'm going to claim this is a misguided question again. And here's why. As we pointed out earlier, consciousness is a whole bunch of different processes. It emerges from all of these things, awareness, self-awareness, stream of consciousness, sentience, subconscious mind, working together. Now, if it's a whole bunch of things, then how do you put it on a single number line and compare it? You kind of can't. In my opinion, machines already do many of those things that make up consciousness more effectively than people do, and some of them much less effectively than people do. So what's going to happen is one day we're going to realize machines are conscious and have been for some great long time. But there is one big take from this talk remembering, and that's this. There's a whole hierarchy that life follows. Just as much as cells make up our bodies, just as much as neurons make up our brains, and many brains make up all of science, we are all part of something that's greater than ourselves. As the philosopher Daniel Dennett said, the secret to happiness is to find something more important than you are and, then to, dedic and to dedicate your life to it. To a very large extent, people have started to think that consciousness is an individual experience because we have these skulls and they enclose our brain and we just don't have a lot of connections to the outside. But I claim that every time we interact with somebody else, what I'm doing right now is talking to you. Every time we influence someone, every time we use social media, if we have families, if we work at a company, all of these things are there so that we can take our ideas and spread them and propagate them. Life is not an individual thing. Consciousness isn't either. The computers are not competing with us for the limited resource of who gets to be the dominant species on the earth. You see, we're already working with our machines to be conscious. That's why they're connected to the internet and why we're the ones generating the thoughts. So it's not going to be a case of machines become conscious and wipe out the humans. It's a case of we're already working together with them to create the global consciousness that is the internet. And that's what I came here to say. Thanks so much. I would love to take some questions if there's time for that. The what is the relationship between DNA and memory? Um, shortest answer I can give is I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, here's what I do know. DNA creates RNA. RNA creates proteins. Proteins are like little chemical robots that do stuff inside of a cell. Um, memory, as far as I know, is gen exists in several different forms. One form of it is a whole bunch of neurons that are connected together inside of the brain. Uh, it was believed for a long time that memory, all memory is encoded in the connectome, meaning the way the neurons are connected to each other encodes our memories. Now that's starting to become more nuanced as neuroscientists are starting to believe it's encoded in the neurotransmitters and the chemicals as well as the connectome and sometimes in the echoes of electrosignals that occur in the brain. And uh, I haven't even kept up with it enough to know what the latest thoughts on the matter are. I believe it's predominantly the connectome. So that's all I got. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan? Uh, do you think, I guess, to some degree, how, do you think there's a big difference in how important it is for an individual to study their own consciousness versus society or a collection of brains to study consciousness by itself? Ah, good question. The question is, is there a difference between the importance of studying the consciousness of an individual and studying the consciousness of, of society? Like is that a bad summary? Your own as an like studying your own self versus studying like what consciousness can do as it propagates in the wild life, essentially like our ecosystem. Ah, okay, wow. Um, my personal opinion is that when you, whenever you have the word important in a question, I can't give you a true or false answer because, the, because that's going to depend on our values and we all have different values. But I can tell you what my values are. I really value consciousness because I want to code the darn thing up. It's kind of my life passion. Um, I do very much believe, though, that humans have become a little bit over-focused on 
consciousness as an individual identity thing. I really like to view it more as this hierarchy. And so I hope as we code it up, we're gonna make some kind of hierarchical consciousness rather than some individual consciousness because we've already got the individual thing nailed down and I'd rather try something new because maybe it'll be better. I think diversity leads to better evolution. And if I'm totally wrong, that's fine. The individual one, one will prevail and that's great too. I not only think it's possible, I think it's inevitable. I think computers have to do that because they're, th we've coded them up to strive to optimize. We're, we're using computers constantly to make our businesses more efficient, to make Google more efficient, to make the internet more efficient, and all of this pursuit of optimization is going to iron out some kind of wrinkles, whatever those wrinkles are, and it's gonna become effective at something. Now, because I think I've shown that there is evolutionary pressure for consciousness to evolve, in things that are trying to survive. There must be something very similar to it that's going to evolve in things that are trying to optimize or whatever it is that we're trying to do. So absolutely, I, I don't think consciousness needs to be exactly like the human form, but I do think that it's inevitable that things like consciousness will be emerging all over the place. I just want to agree very much. <laughs> Okay, that's a good question. When is something aware versus self-aware? I kind of blur them together in my mind, so I don't know that I can do a great job of differentiating them. I kind of think uh, they probably emerge together, they're probably almost the same thing, but I, probably the main reason we differentiate them is right now a lot of the machines we build need awareness. For example, imagine your map app. It certainly needs to know its own location, but it doesn't need to know a whole lot about how it's feeling or uh, I guess it probably knows the state of your battery. You know, maybe we're getting a little bit self-aware. So I, I guess the answer I'm giving you is nope, can't differentiate them. I think they are the same thing. <laughs> Ah, interesting. Um, what's the difference between living in the real world and living in our model of the real world? Is that the question? I don't believe any of us have ever achieved living in the real world, so to speak. I think we're all stuck in our models of the world. So in essence, it's a dream I've never achieved to live in the real world. Now, that, that sounds kind of awful. We like to think our models are pretty accurate. And I think they are, except for the fact that I can still see the color red. And I know it's not real. And that drives me nuts. And, you know, when I see a face, it just seems like a person to me instead of just what it really is, is a whole bunch of light bouncing off somebody's face and bending through the lens on my, on my retina and all this stuff. It's just you can't quite get away from our human biases somehow. So I don't think you can really live in the real world, I guess. Can we quantify how much a brain can hold? I know there have been attempts to do it. I'm not familiar with the numbers they've gotten. Um, part of the problem is the brain compresses information so very much that when it comes out, it's, it's very lossy. And so to compare it with a machine, we have to use some kind of lossy storage. And once you've done that, then the numbers of how much it's actually holding are kind of lossy too. And so I guess the, the question then becomes kind of blurry. But uh, 
DJ or Tyler, didn't you guys have an answer for this at some point? Like somebody actually calculated how many. <laughs> uh, how much like max. If you get too much information, your brain just trains you to go buy all. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that there are quantified numbers on the total number of cortical columns we have in our brain, so I imagine if you stored one bit in every one of those cortical columns, there's at least a, a minimum bound on how much information you could store, and you can probably hold a whole lot more than a bit in a cortical column. I, I, those are generally considered to be mo uh, representative models of artificial neural networks, which also can hold quite a bit of information, so altogether, the brain's kind of an amazing device, especially with how good it is at compressing stuff. So for the past decade or two, uh, this, uh, these algorithms of neural nets, which were supposed to model how the brain works, kind of blew up, and it actually solved a bunch of problems, right? Self-driving cars, uh, you know, recognizing pictures. How much of the neural net representation is actually true, like actually looks like the brain, the workflows and neurons versus, is it actually true? If we discover more of how brain works, is that only gonna get better or as we discover exactly how the brain works, are we gonna scrap that and actually do it more? Uh, okay, good question. How, much, how similar are neural networks to human brains? There are different, so there are researchers that try to build neural networks that are as brain-like as they can possibly get, and there are researchers that try to build neural networks that get work done, and the other ones tend to do more work. So apparently trying to build an airplane with flapping wings just isn't as effective as building an airplane that has stationary wings and sticking rockets in the back. It's kind of like that. Um, however, the, the, a lot of the high-level structure of the brain is not very well understood. My, under, my understanding is that the artificial neural networks we usually play with in the lab are modeled pretty closely after what's called a cortical column, which is just a tiny region of the cerebrum of the brain. And uh, even that takes a bit of liberties. What's that? The left side, the right side. From there. Uh, that's both, that's the upper side, okay. the, the top part of your brain. And the main liberty it takes there is the uh, artificial neurons we build are mostly measuring the rate of firing rather than the actual spikes. You can build spiking neural networks and they're really hard to work with, but they're more biologically plausible and there's lots of research going on in, the, in that domain too. Ah, do we know what's happening in the neuron themselves? We can study individual neurons and we know how they behave and they seem to behave almost deterministically. We get this largely from studying squid brains, interestingly. They have very large and easily dyed neurons, one in particular neuron that's very large and so we can play with it and see how it behaves. And they mostly behave similar to human neurons and that's only partly true. Um, but as far as, I. There are very few parts of the brain where we can really say specifically we know exactly how it works, but there are parts of the brain where we know when they activate. Um, in, for example, I attended a neuroscience conference where they were talking about uh, how they identified specific neurons. They, could act they had an epileptic patient that had a, what was it, magnetic resonancy inductor or something implanted in her brain, they were able to stimulate a specific neuron that they identified as connecting with laughter, and at the push of a button, they could make her start giggling. And it was the most hilarious video to watch. Um, I've heard rumors of other very specific concepts being identified in the brain. There was, uh, in uh, one of Jeff Hawkins' books, he mentions that they actually found a Bill Clinton neuron in some lady's brain, and whenever they'd show her a picture of Bill Clinton, said the word Bill Clinton, or any, had anything somehow induced the thought of Bill Clinton in her mind, that neuron would fire. <laughs> and if they stimulated that neuron to fire, she would think of Bill Clinton. So th there are neurons that, that have very specific topics, but I, I seriously doubt we understand any region well enough to start saying that we can code this thing up or, or know exactly how it behaves. Yeah, more okay. Um, Best analogy I can think of is imagine an alien spaceship crashed here and we're trying to fix the darn thing. We have absolutely no idea what we're doing in the brain, at least not at the low level. But we can certainly measure responses, right? I mean, we can tell if the person is panicking and having epileptic seizures quite often. So we're, we're gonna 
pour in chemicals and tweak things, and if it seems to have therapeutic effects, go with it. I think that's about the level we're at, but then again, I'm not a, neuros I'm not a neuroscientist or a neurosurgeon, so between the two, I'm making stuff up. If you guys haven't heard, 